would like to thank first just uh, and Fabrizio for inviting me. Uh, my name is Luca Caruso and I'm an uh, architect and building engineer. Today I'm going to be talking about some lessons we learned learn from, from Italy, from the Italian researchers that are focused on conservation and restoration of these buildings and also uh, buildings that are quite old compared to the modern one. Um, so far I've been working in Malta for four years and I, I got quite got uh, a gist of what is happening um, over here and what are the potential being a small island state in terms of sustainability and also uh, the flows uh, flowness that we are uh, experiencing every day. And uh, the structure of the presentation is divided in three parts. Uh, I would like to give you first um, a general overview of why we should care about heritage and create this thing with sustainability. Sometimes it's not very well, uh, well emphasized. Then we move to best practice and international standards because um, those studies now are gaining, a, let's say, international interest. And then some conclusion I got from my researches. So, um, to put this into a wider framework, um, I was looking into ICOMOS website and uh, according in 2021, just, they just came out with this five P's. For them, the link between heritage and sustainable development goals should be done through people, planet, prosperity, peace and partnerships. Especially when we share the knowledge um, between communities, this, uh, this rapport between culture and nature um, can bring us to achieve the so-called well-being of the planet. And um, the prosperity of communities as well, it's quite relevant for us to be understood because if we invest so much money on uh, all buildings to protect them, uh, we hope that this will lead to something better. However, this is, um, we are in the so-called climate urgency and um, we must know what is happening at another level that is above the built environment. Um, Professor Charles Gattis uh, in 2021 just released uh, one of his, uh, of his research um, and he was asking himself, himself what are the impacts of climate change on the island of Malta? Well, first and foremost, we need to know that Mediterranean climate and the Mediterranean as a geographical entity uh, is a hotspot for climate change. And according to his uh, research, what we are expecting um, are, in terms of frequency of events, um, <coughs> we will be experiencing higher frequency of uh, air temperature extreme, fair weather, sea level rise, hydrological drought, aridity and warmer lands. And on the other side, we will experience lower, um, let's say, lower frequency in terms of wind speed, the wind speed will slow down, and rainfall. And I'm a bit concerned about this because in Malta, being at the center of the Mediterranean, could exploit a lot of wind energy, but also it can make uh, careful use of rainfall. Because of this, um, we need to move from an idea that buildings has to be uh, designed with, um, with this eco-efficient uh, exercise typical of what we know as green buildings. It means um, water and energy conservation and also a careful uh, reduction of waste. We need to move to something that we call regenerative building. Regenerative buildings are a building that is not doing less harm but is net positive 
Um, it has an ecological impact, not just um, careful, eco-efficiently um, assessment. And to do this, we have to still keep on working on water, on water, waste and energy, but also we have to carefully select materials, we have to have a better management of the building, and uh, we have to think that buildings are, are an integral part of our day-to-day -day activities. So that they, are, they have a, a huge impact on health and our health and well-being. Also, buildings are not isolated, the isolated elements in, the, in our cities, but they are in close contact with our communities and the surrounding places. That's why um, in October 2021, uh, we at the university introduced and with the Department of Environmental Design, we, um, uh, we initiated the first discussion about uh, regenerative buildings in Malta and their application because this concept uh, is quite well developed in mainland Europe but for Ireland um, we found this gap. We didn't, uh, we didn't know if it were, was working or not. So we discussed with several experts, local experts, understanding what should be done and what, what is not feasible in Malta. And there are available, it's available on YouTube channel, uh, the full recording of this presentation. This presentation is one of the outcome that comes from uh, this uh, Costco store um, research project. Um, we invited um, in Malta to speak in Malta, and most of the many initiators of this uh, research project, and um, we were delving into all these aspects from um, the language and the, uh, the glossary behind the definitions because it's important to understand what is sustainability, what is restorative, what is regenerative. And also uh, we look into the various design process and also the construction process as well. But uh, let's get back to the Maltese issues. And in uh, 2022, uh, this year, uh, ERA, uh, the Environmental Agency in Malta, just released a new national uh, environmental plan. Uh, they were asking for comments. What we discovered, what I discovered, is that uh, Malpisa Archipelago, the total uh, land covered by buildings, is up to 34%. And this uh, coverage um, increased plus 38% since 1995. Uh, we have seen it because the boom, the construction boom that happened in Malta, so uh, it's quite uh, interesting figures. At the same time, uh, we are still dealing with topics uh, like near energy, near zero energy buildings. And uh, in Malta, uh, there was, uh, under the support of the EU Directive, Energy Performance of Buildings Directive, there was this need to demonstrate Italian uh, Maltese commitment to uh, this um, question of um, how to make energy, uh, building energy um, safe features. And what we discovered is that the buildings uh, that have been built uh, between 1980 and 1970s um, are around 44,000. And I want to highlight like this because um, these are more or less the buildings that were built um, before the introduction and of this, uh, let's say, technological link of concrete uh, structures. This is quite important because we, we can have this big distinction between more what we call modern buildings with the use of insulation, with the use of concrete and different type of uh, construction technologies with the older way of doing buildings in modern. This plan also give us um, an interesting uh, insight on the built asset we have in modern. And uh, I'm not focusing only on that 44,000, but in general, and thanks to the census analysis, we discovered that 
52 percent back in 2015. 52 percent of buildings uh, are conditioning. Only 11 percent of them have uh, installed insulation, and just a few of them, in terms of dwellings, add solar water heaters. It means that they were de deploying um, renewable energy strategies. This comes at no surprise that the, long, the recent long-term renovation strategy for 2050 uh, is giving us this, uh, this overall picture of the built asset, especially when it comes to the performance, energy performance of our buildings. Both new and old ones are poorly performing. We can see it from the values, and we can see also from the efficiency of the system, both, um, let's say, um, the heating one, the COP, and also the EER. Let's go more or less. Let's, say, but, um, let's move on. Professor Kassar, um, the first day of the presentation, said, How can we learn from the past um, to, to go where we should go? Um, I agree with her. And also, our, um, our research um, has told us that we can build better buildings because we learn from what has been done before, you know? We know that we have to care about reducing the diffusion losses, uh, we have to control labor, we have to reduce the exchange, the thermal uh, exchange between walls, uh, between indoor and outdoor environment. We need to improve the ventilation in our buildings. And we have to protect from capillary rise. And this is what we know. The, the knowledge is available, already available. Uh, it comes at almost no cost, zero cost. But then, energy, energy performance, sustainability principles, sometimes they, um, they are, uh, let's say, um, competing in some aspect with the uh, heritage and uh, restoration principles uh, because um, sometimes, in, especially in Italy, superintendents uh, stopped uh, the diffusion of those um, uh, improvements in terms of energy performance because uh, they believe that energy performance uh, is, is being carried out only by using strategies, design strategies that are um, being developed for contemporary buildings. Uh, sometimes it's true, um, but luckily we have materials, we have, the, uh, let's say, uh, a catalog of best practice that can work even for, uh, um, for heritage building, possibly even listed building. And according to Professor Giovanni Carbonara, uh, Italian expert in restoration, um, what we need to understand, um, and also following Professor John Edwards' uh, presentation in some, for some aspect, we have first to investigate the reason for the conservation and restoration. Also, we have an architectural image to be protected, um, because this is an expression of material culture. It means that that building has been built at that time with that type of skills with that type of material and it, it is an expression of the culture that was happening uh, at the time. There is also the need to have a careful, careful reflection on the relation between restoration, reuse, rehabilitation and the functional retrofit. So if we bring uh, HVAC system, we need to know exactly why we should use it and up to which level we need to bring the existing building those kind of buildings, uh, do we need to know, ask ourselves, do we really need to have such a high level of uh, microclimate control that is asked uh, for contemporary buildings? Question mark. Also, the true conservation requires a reuse that is soft, balanced, and in compliance with the notion of integrated conservation. This is taken from the Declaration of Amsterdam. So, in an answer, and if we consider uh, one of the paradigm in uh, restoration as being uh, the minimal intervention, we can uh, simply overlap. It's quite 
straightforward to overlap with some of the paradigm, paradigms in uh, sustainability, being uh, the misconsumption of materials and energy. So they go end to end, but first we have to use uh, this methodology to really understand what needs to be done and what. So this is this. We go into the second part of the presentation, and uh, I would like to make this comparison, and also would like to create a chronological set, series of events, because um, I, dis I just discovered while preparing the presentation that um, the Italian Ministry of Culture released this document, this guideline regarding the energy efficiency in uh, heritage building, and uh, then three years later. And history in England and released a similar document where we can, and I've seen uh, a series of uh, a parallelism can be done between the, the two. Um, the Italian guidelines are mainly focusing on the passive solution. And this, I think, it's very important because um, when we think of those buildings that has been built before 1945 and even earlier. Mm, we didn't have, we didn't have such uh, advanced uh, technology, such, such advanced plan. So they had to work on a passive mode. And uh, but now we know that if we want to bring up to a certain level of uh, comfort, it's important to remember that uh, some we have to introduce, introduce some some form of technology. It means that it's important to mention the some some inter interesting uh, technology like heat pumps and renewable energy strategy. So um, this catalog, um, this um, guideline, it's a compendium, it's a catalog of best practices and it's going to cover, uh, it's cover walls, windows, slabs and roofs. Um, it also gives you an idea and it's also important to create this thing with the story England. Um, where we have to understand the interaction between building fabric, uh, building services and people. So if we really want to have healthy, energy efficient and uh, careful conservation, uh, and quite careful conservation principles, we have to understand this, what is called trias energetica. Buildings, uh, what buildings? Uh, behave differently from uh, exist, uh, contemporary one, uh, mainly for one aspect. Um, we used to build with bio-based material. And bio-based material, because of their porosity, they have, um, pro let's say, they have to deal with a mechanism of moisture transfer on top of heat transfer. Um, contemporary buildings are the tendency is to build dry, so we don't need to have those problems anymore, especially uh, in, um, when, when, when we construct them. But whole buildings, um, they have all those aspects to be taken into account, um, so, so that basically uh, we have to deal with bubble diffusion, bubble convection, capillary action, conduction, um, convection and radiation. So the mechanism of heat transfer and mechanism of moisture transfer are interrelated, and uh, heat transfer carries out moisture and vice versa. So um, when we try to simulate those kind of behavior in building and uh, building simulating tools, uh, we need to solve a question, a differential equation. So it's quite an advanced uh, topic. So now. Um, what are the materials that are being recommended by those guidelines? Um, they cover different aspects, as I was showing you. And some of them are the so-called reflective insulating materials, uh, vacuum insulated panels, line-based thermal renders, bio-based insulated materials, both organic with organic or inorganic fibers, glazing with selective coating, insulating glazing units, Glaze banks, um, cool materials uh, with a high solar reflectance, reflectance index for both roof and walls, and also phase change materials. 
I will show you briefly what is song about, and it's quite interesting. Unfortunately, this uh, this guideline is not available in English. Uh, would be would have been quite interesting for uh, the Saxon community to, to to learn about what what they have uh, identified as an interesting best practice. But um, well, um, what is being proposed is basically that uh, to improve our buildings. Uh, it doesn't say that you have to apply them all. Uh, again, we have steps, we have to identify what is what really matters. But in a nutshell, the single, uh, the single uh, um, solution proposed are it's either ventilated or non-ventilated insulated pitch roof. Uh, we can internally insulate the flat roof. Um, we can work on the walls. Uh, if possible, if necessary, we can use uh, external insulating cladding panel or we internally insulate it or whenever this is not possible, we can refer to line-based line thermal render. It means that um, it will help, not, it won't be as effective as uh, insulation cladding panel, but it will help us in maintaining the superficial temperature um, Slightly higher than the, the condensation uh, limits threshold. Um, in Malta, there was a disevolution of technological, technology, measuring uh, technology. And uh, in, uh, in the 1950, uh, we, still, we were still building uh, uh, 50 centimeter uh, thick walls with a cavity between. Then it went down up to 400 or millimeters or less. But then, when, com um, when concrete technology came along and it became, uh, let's say, percussive everywhere, um, we got rid of one leaf and we start building in a single leaf wall. Um, most of them um, have been focused mostly on. Uh, uh, structural properties. Uh, but then in 2010, prof thanks to uh, Professor Dion Buajar, um, we introduced in Malta uh, the topic of circularities. So, um, let's say, um, reusing existing, existing Lobigerina, okay, uh, Maltese limestone, to build new blocks that are uh, structurally sound with, a, with good uh, compressive strength. In 2020, um, with Professor Guajar, um, just filed a design registration for the so-called double C block. And uh, this block is, uh, is a circular uh, material because it uses uh, recycled concrete. Structure is a structural uh, sound, and also thanks to the insulation, because you can imagine these are the two these two concrete leaves are bound together by an insulation layer that is acting as a thermal, microthermal and acoustical barrier and also uh, because of its adhesive properties helps these two elements in, in place. So we see this evolution of technological measuring with new, um, with new requirements that were not taken into account before. And now I'm working alongside Professor Guajar as a research support officer and PhD student. And again, we learned, we used, we built those two tessels in uh, at the University of Malta, and uh, we applied uh, what we learned from the past. You know, we have to protect the roofs uh, and the ground slab. In order, and we over insulate it because of our research purposes in order to move all the thermal uh, conduction to the walls and test them uh, and test the performance of those walls. Those walls made up uh, in double C box uh, as will be comp uh, compared to the traditional all core box. Uh, we will be showing that this performance both acoustically and, um, and thermally are uh, superior while keeping the structural properties.
Um, if you don't, if you cannot, allow, let's put it this way. If uh, since existing building tends to have uh, thick walls, uh, that they are relatively, re relatively uh, good at insulating, good insulating properties, you can decide only to work on Windows. And the solution proposed for Windows are uh, quite interesting. We can either totally replace the Windows if they don't have any historical values, or replace just the glass in pane and keep the frame. We can add an additional high-performance window or just a, an additional glazing pane on top of the existing one. We can improve the dull-proofing of windows. Uh, we can add a selective coating or a fill or a PV um, panels on top of it. Or we can also add a remote control mechanism to allow for, uh, to facilitate uh, natural ventilation strategies. And yes, it's important to control the incoming sun radiation, so we can decide also to have uh, indoor or outdoor sunscreens, as well as uh, possibly using uh, alternatively uh, the so called light shelves that will bring daylight um, inside the building. And I want to stress on the importance of building simulations uh, because uh, before even touching the building, we already can predict with uh, local, uh, typical um, weather data the behavior of those structures we're going to build. In particular, uh, in this project, uh, I was working with engineer uh, Miguel Putar and Perit Carmen Sutton, and I was uh, task to perform uh, this daylight simulation and it's basically um, we are creating a grid by following the perimeter of this office uh, building and then the main question was what is the daylight autonomy of this building uh, due to the presence of the to, to, due to the selected uh, colors of indoor surfaces and the selected windows and also including those uh, shaving devices here. And uh, under the illumination, the illumination threshold of 300 lux and uh, between January and December uh, during office hour, 7 to 17. Um, as you can see from the, from the threshold, we were exceptionally performing because the building is well, uh, well lit thanks to natural light during office hours. So that's uh, one other question is, um, if we want to bring buildings up to a particular level, especially existing one, uh, we can also talk about in terms of ranges of, uh, of performance. So that uh, we cannot, we don't push the building to, the existing building to contemporary water standard, but we know with a few, with minimal intervention, what works to, to serve the purpose of uh, restoration and conservation for purposes. Um, coming back to the other strategies, um, recommended are uh, insulation of uh, slabs exposed to basement, as well as insulating ground slab. Um, finally, we have um, other strategies against uh, capillarity and the most famous are cutting the measure at the base without waterproofing barrier or chemical barriers or using electrical barriers uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, renders and plasters that has an enhanced vapor transmission. And in conclusion, some of the other uh, passive design strategies are, of course, outdoor shaving system, the attachment of uh, greenhouses, the use of light tubes that are quite effective when uh, you cannot bring light inside the building and or you cannot build the courtyard inside. Especially in those uh, narrow and long um, and long uh, plots where the Malta it might be uh, an interesting solution. Also, the solar chimney is quite interesting uh, as well. Um, this solar chimney um, 
It's important to mention because in these guidelines, uh, the very first um, best practice and case studies of sustainable restoration is um, the Malta uh, Stock Exchange Restoration in 2006. And as you can see, this part is made up of a mechanically controlled, remote controlled windows that um, were about to open when uh, the proper uh, indoor condition need to be need to evacuate hot air and then bring cooler air. They were cooling the air through nozzles, spraying water, and then since the um, cold air has a higher density, it has to go down and push up the, the hot air. Unfortunately, then it comes to audit and commissioning. Unfortunately, this system of passive down growth uh, cooling has been the commission because it was a working problem. So back then, uh, for some was a failure, for some for others was a landmark case studies that showed us it might work. But we need to test. We need to be to invest in those technologies. Otherwise, we won't know. We we will not know. And the second one I want to mention is the need for historic buildings. Uh, we all know uh, lead green uh, those uh, green ready scheme of the work. And uh, what they did at the Green Public Council in Italy uh, is basically taking the most important, uh, replacing the most important strategies. Uh, with someone that are pertinent to heritage building. And uh, this is a point-based system, so you have to fulfill the requisites and then select additional credits in order to reach the, the rating you want. And this rating is also achievable according to your budget. So you can opt for, uh, there is no good or wrong, but it's just, if you want to achieve a silver rating because you have the budget to do this, you can just stick with the 50 to 60 points, otherwise you reach the button, the highest um, rating possible. And I would like to just emphasize uh, a few of them. The one, the first one is the historic values. So, uh, Professor John just showed us there is a process in understanding the building and we have to follow it entirely and totally. And this uh, rating scheme um, is supporting this process and is say is giving you, let's say, uh, additional. Uh, is saying is, let's say, it comes at a premium in sense that you select the more credits you select, the more analysis you do because you want to know better the buildings, the existing building, the better, so you can get more points. And this uh, selected um, assessment are the energy audit. Uh, let's say thermography or uh, analysis of the U value, uh, advanced analysis in terms of structural monitoring, but one important thing is also the chemical and physical compatibility of the, of the selected material used for the restoration process. Then we have the topic of indoor environmental quality. Indoor environmental quality is quite important uh, nowadays because. Um, it's, it's linked to the topic of health and well-being in, in buildings. We live uh, in buildings for not most of, almost 90% of our time. So, as you can see, it covers the topic of indoor air quality, and the volatile organic compounds, the emission that material has in terms of indoor air pollutants, uh, from adhesives, sealants, uh, paints, coatings, fluorid system, and wood, but also thermal comfort and lighting comfort. Um, to give you an idea of what indoor environmental quality is, it's a branch uh, of architectural science, and, and they are just focused on those topics the light, acoustic, thermal, and environmental quality. Why matters indoor environmental quality? Indoor environmental quality matters because it prevents the so-called sick building syndrome. Uh, 
This term was coined by the World, uh, World Health Organization Working Group in 1982 because of the increasing evidence that buildings are making us feel sick. And they call it syndrome because it's a collection of symptoms. Uh, and in particular, interesting because those symptoms are temporarily related to the time spent in a particular building and they resolve when the, when the individual is leaving the building. They might be also seasonally, according to the eating or cooling cycles, and also even for workers, for peers and other similar complaints. And the importance of indoor environmental quality and this also air quality, um, it's quite relevant because we need to carefully select furniture, uh, materials like sound and thermal insulation, but also the wood we choose and adhesive, etc. Uh, nowadays, it's easier than before uh, when those uh, schemes came along. Uh, they were so pioneeristic in this, in this end. So um, now, uh, even manufacturers are compliant with those standards. So they can provide you with evidence with third party certificates uh, that uh, declare in a transparent way what are the impacts in terms of ecotoxicity and human toxicity. And again, this is uh, the, the, the strategies regarding material and resources. Again, there is a stress on the reuse of materials, uh, the use of third party certification, but also demolition and construction waste management. So, in conclusion, um, there's our, these are my two cents, essentially. Uh, we have to learn from the past, so we, so we know where to go, essentially. And we, we have the knowledge available, we just need to sit, learn, study, and also convince the client to embark on this journey of not doing uh, the business as usual uh, work. There is, I'm strongly recommending this aspect, there is an untapped opportunity for using, for deploying advanced simulation models to predict the behavior of the, of the buildings. And I show you uh, some, some of those uh, simulations that has been, been carried out at the design stage. They are now faster than before. There are no excuses. Um, I believe we need a de uh, to develop our robust catalog of best practice uh, tailor made for different environments. And also, I think we need to provide incentives to push the diffusion of those holistic green ready schemes. Uh, because they will resolve the so called split incentive issue. So, the overall goal of the developer are in contrast with the tenant or the user. Thanks.